Ladies and gentlemen, welcome on the virtual premises of the Institute for History of Medicine and Foreign Languages, which is part of the first faculty of medicine at the Charles University in Prague. My name is Tomáš Alušík and I'm associate professor of the Institute. As some of you may know, from time to time, we organize lectures where speakers talk about a broad range of topics more or less connected with the underlying theme of history and archaeology of medicine. This year is no exception, although we had to move our activities into the virtual settings. Speaking of which, I would like to ask everyone in the audience to keep your microphone muted and your cameras turned off. I don't, uh, don't want to waste your time, so let me first thank everyone in the audience for coming here. It's nice to meet you, and I would also like to thank the speaker, Professor Erika Charters. Erika Charters is Associate Professor of Global History and the History of Medicine and Governing Body Fellow of the Wolfson College, University of Oxford. She is also Director of the Oxford Center for the History of Science, Medicine and Technology based at the Faculty of History. Her research examines disease, state power, warfare, and how these intersect in the 18th century, especially in colonial context. She is also interested in the relationship between war and civil society during the early modern period. More specifically, her research focuses on manpower during the 18th century, examining the history of bodies as well as the history of methods used to measure and enhance bodies, labor, and population as a whole, including the history of statistics. Since disease was the biggest threat to manpower in the early modern world, she looks at how disease environments throughout the world shaped military, commercial, and agricultural power, as well as how overseas experiences shaped European theories of medicine, biology, and race, alongside political methodologies such as statistics and censuses. In the context of COVID-19, Erika is coordinating a multidisciplinary project on how epidemics end, which is the topic of her today's lecture. Erika, please, the microphone is yours. Thank you very much. I'm just going to share my screen um, as I have a few images uh, that I want to use. So a huge thank you first off to Tomas for this very kind invitation. Thank you also to Charles University and to the Institute, um, which I very much hope that I can actually visit in person once indeed this epidemic has ended. So this talk, as Tomas mentioned, this talk is part of a broader project which examines this big question of how epidemics end. So this is very much a work in progress and I'm looking forward to your suggestions and your questions and your comments at the end. Now I first began thinking about this question uh, when a colleague who's a partner with me on the project, Kristen Heitman, when Kristen asked me way back in the summer of 2020, how do epidemics end? And although there's been a lot to occupy us since then, this question kept nagging at me and because I realized that even though I'm a historian of disease, I don't actually know the answer. What I am convinced of is that this is a question that requires not just historians, but multiple disciplines in order to answer it. And so across October and November of 2020, I started assembling um, what is now more than 40 researchers who work on a variety of epidemics, really from all over the world and from different disciplinary approaches to answer this question. So the project has epidemiologists, biologists, archeologists, historians, and political scientists. So what I'm going to present today draws on the project's first publication, which examined really a range of scholarship from dis different disciplines um, in order to provide some preliminary answers to this question. But I'm also gonna draw on developing research that's coming out of the project's online workshops, which we held across uh, January, as well as some of the interviews we're holding and preliminary analysis. So in what follows, I have three points that I want to make about the end of epidemics. The first point is that it's clear that when we compare how much attention we uh, paid to studying the origin and the unfolding of an epidemic, it's clear that by contrast, we spend far less time studying the ending of epidemics. The second point I'd like to make is that when we do conduct detailed analysis on endings, it becomes clear that an epidemic's end is not the same as the end of the disease. And at the same time, there are also multiple endings to an epidemic. 
And we see these multiple endings, not only when we look across the world, but even within one society. And so as a result, focusing on endings lets us see that epidemics are not only biological phenomenon, but of course also political, cultural, and social phenomenon. My final point is that when we focus on the end part of an epidemic, this also reshapes how we understand the epidemic as a whole. And I think in some ways it helps us to move away from um, the temptation to talk about things such as lessons learned, and instead to try to rethink how we use and apply disciplinary expertise when we're researching disease. So for the first part, what has been written about endings? For historians, I think it's very likely that it's Charles Rosenberg's article, which is called What is an Epidemic, that has both crystallized and shaped how we study and understand epidemics. Um, the article was first published in 1989 and has been republished. And I should note that just yesterday, the Bulletin for the History of Medicine released a special issue, which is um, not only republishes Rosenberg's full essay, but has a whole series of articles that are um, reanalyzing uh, Rosenberg's article in the context of COVID-19. So as Rosenberg put it back in 1989, epidemics should be seen as narratives. In his words, they are events, not trends. Epidemics are therefore social phenomena with a dramaturgic form. So as he explains in his words, epidemics start at a moment in time, proceed on a stage limited in space and duration, following a plot line of increasing and relevatory tension, move to a crisis of individual and collective character, then drift toward closure. And so in other words, what we see here is how epidemics follow a narrative, allowing historians to compare and contrast epidemics across time and space. And writers on epidemics outline a standard pattern of warnings that are foretold and then ignored, building towards social and cultural crisis, complete with communal rituals of control and expiation, and then a decline into an end, all within a moral framework in which the afflicted society and or its individuals can finally reflect upon the lessons learned. So as one historian commented, thinking about this framework, after discussing a range of epidemics from the ancient world to the modern day, is there not a common dramaturgy to all epidemics? Were we simply learning that there was a fundamental and often repeated human response to such biological events, a familiar set of perhaps involuntary social reflexes? I think what Rosenberg also usefully highlighted and thinking especially here how his essay was written during the early stages of the AIDS epidemic in America, what he highlighted is how epidemics are therefore also about drama. It has a high point of crisis and tension. And so the end of an epidemic is therefore when the drama ceases, when society's attention is no longer focused on the crisis of disease. An example of this can be found in, um, I think, what is a seminal account of an epidemic for Western literature and Western history, which is Thucydides' account of the plague of 430 BC in Athens. And although much has been written and debated as to what disease Thucydides describes, as well as to what extent one can determine its mortality rates and its social consequences, I think it's widely agreed that Thucydides' account is a foundational epidemic narrative. And this is particularly the case as epidemic narratives have this eerie habit of referring back to, if not echoing, previous accounts in their telling. So as one historian explains, uh, and this is in his words, I'm quoting, one can never be entirely sure about the extent to which chroniclers of epidemics concentrated on social dislocation, the failure of doctors, flights to and from religion, rumors of poison wells, and similar phenomena, simply because Thucydides and later writers down to Defoe taught them to look for them. So I think it's significant to understand how, how Thucydides recounts the end of this devastating plague. So after he describes the symptoms, the deaths, the social dislocation, the economic devastation and political upheaval caused by the plague, the disease, 
simply disappears from Thucydides' text. It's mentioned as all-encompassing in distressing terms, but then it's gone. And I want to underline this. Thucydides does not mention a decline in cases, nor even the process of returning to normality. Instead, this, the disease simply disappears from his narrative. Disease has exited the stage without further comment and other actors silently take its place. And so in other words, we, the readers, know that the epidemic is over because it is no longer part of the plot. I think that Thucydides account buttresses Rosenberg's framing of epidemics as dramatic narratives. All right, as, Ro as Rosenberg notes, epidemics simply drift towards closure. And I think the sense of drift seems very much due to the identification of an epidemic's end as the point when the urgency of the disease outbreak has been sufficiently resolved. And therefore, that public attention can be redirected to other issues, such as the moral and social crises that the disease outbreak has exposed. So as historians of medicine, Jeremy Green and Dora Varga remarked in a, in a recent publication focusing on ends, the last part, the end of an epidemic, is perhaps always ever an asymptote, never disappearing, but rather fading to the point where its signal is lost in the noise of a new normal and even allowed in some imaginable future to be forgotten. Now this diversion of attention is replicated in secondary works and those who examine epidemics. Most often after some hundreds and hundreds of pages that recount the origin and the social and economic upheavals in detail, the end of the epidemic is relegated to a brief conclusion or even an afterword um, that's very often titled lessons learned. And so in other words, with the tension already pivoting away from the, from the end itself. And in part, as we can see with Thucydides, this is res the result of the evidence itself. The very definition of the end of an epidemic is when public attention is redirected elsewhere. And so an indication that this urgent problem of disease has been resolved. And so when people stop keeping records of the epidemic. But this diversion of attention is also apparent in declarations of an epidemic's end. So in August of 2010, for example, um, the WHO's declaration of the 2009 H1N1 or swine flu pandemic, when they declared it, it was through a proclamation that the pandemic was now in its, and I quote, in its post-pandemic period. And I think this expression, post-pandemic period, helps to illustrate how the vocabulary, the, the vocabulary for the end of epidemics often focuses more on the stage to come than the end itself. But this pattern also holds in fields beyond history, such as in mathematical modeling of infectious disease. So as a recent epidemiological modeling paper points out, and I'm quoting from the paper, while many works have focused on the growth, peak, and controlled phases of epidemics, much less studied are the tail end dynamics of an epidemic. As a result, the paper points out, there is still much we do not know about the dynamics of an outbreak as it approaches its end. And so I think uh, it's interesting to note how statistical charts of cases, so the epidemic curve or the epi curve, as you can see here, that's so ubiquitous in visualizations of an epidemic's life cycle, as it's called, they provide this underlying temporal framework that mirrors Rosenberg's own linear narrative of origin, climax, and drift to closure. And so just as in historical scholarship, such studies have likewise overwhelmingly focused on modeling transmission dynamics and the growth and the peak of these epi curves, neglecting what is commonly called the control phase of decline and termination. In some ways, of course, this actually helps us to define how epidemics end. And after all, if we think about how an epidemic is clinically defined as, and here's, here I'm um, quoting public health guidelines, so it's clinically defined as an increase, often sudden, in the number of cases of a disease above what is normally expected. By definition, then, this 
epidemic in turn warrants official attention, if not designation as, and here using the terminology of the, of the WHO, a public health emergency of international concern. So the stages of, it, of this epidemic, of an epidemic's life cycle that present themselves for study and reporting are therefore the outbreak, the growth and the climax. By contrast, when the crisis recedes and the disease is no longer a cause for alarm, a society's attention can be directed elsewhere. So this brings me to the second part of my talk, which is when we do dig through records in detail and try to uncover and collect the bits and pieces on ending, what do we find? I think a main point to remember is that we need to disentangle the end of disease from the end of an epidemic. And although a few select epidemics, such as SARS, have been declared ended when cases among humans ceased, most epidemics have not concluded through the end to the disease. And indeed, smallpox is the only human disease ever to have been eradicated. As those who are part of the effort, of the eradication effort candidly stated, its eradication was, in their words, a rare event. Guinea worm, malaria, polio, yaws, and hookworm, among others, have been the target of long-standing eradication campaigns. But all of these campaigns have either been downgraded to local campaigns to control the disease, or they've had their target dates extended. When we think about elimination, so elimination of a disease at a regional level very much works for diseases of livestock because the movement of animals can be restricted. And of course, you can also cull or kill livestock. But as virologists and public health specialists point out, the inability to control human movement makes regional eradic eradication an oxymoron. Moreover, the diseases that have been targeted for eradication right now, um, so smallpox successfully eradicated, but right now guinea worm and polio, for example, were and are not, strictly speaking, epidemic diseases. Instead, these diseases were and are generally at endemic levels in the countries identified for the eradication. And indeed, many eradication campaigns have faced overwhelming obstacles because they identify and frame their target diseases as urgent problems, whereas the societies and governments in question often accept these diseases as endemic and thus normal if unpleasant parts of life compared to more pressing crises. So this means that if we follow even very recent and very modern forms of public health authority in looking at the declarations of an epidemic's end, such as here the WHO, we find this continual distinction between the end of an epidemic and the end of disease. So as I mentioned, the 2009 H1N1 swine flu pandemic was declared by the WHO in August 2010 to be in a post-pandemic period. And the WHO actually explained that in this post-pandemic period, and this is their words, cases and outbreaks due to the H1N1 2009 virus are expected to occur according to seasonal patterns of influenza. And so in many ways, this simply follows a longstanding historical practice of distinguishing between an end of disease and the end of an epidemic. So medieval Arab medical texts, for example, distinguish between widespread or epidemic outbreaks and individual cases of disease. And this can also be seen in individual declarations of an end. So in April of 1712, for example, Frederick IV of Denmark declared the end of a plague epidemic through a national day of prayer and thanksgiving, uh, thanksgiving, as well as reopening the city gates, even though individual cases of plague were still observed. Likewise, in England, the end of its many 19th century cholera epidemics um, was most often declared through days of thanksgiving, but it was clear in the language of these days of thanksgiving that the disease had not ended. So in 1849, for example, if we look at the language, there was a declaration of a general thanksgiving to almighty God upon the great decrease of cholera. Other uh, declarations use the term abatement. Um, 
for cholera. And this language accurately captured the reality that these days of Thanksgiving were about the decline and not the end of cholera in England. So in this week when in 1849, when Queen Victoria declared a national day of general Thanksgiving, there were still 11 deaths from cholera recorded in London alone. Mathematical modeling of epidemics also incorporates this distinction between the end of disease and the end of an epidemic. For example, John Grant, who was a 17th century London merchant, was one of the first to try to quantitatively calculate patterns of disease by using 16th and 17th century London mortality bills to tally periodic mortalities. Um, Grant is often called the father of epidemiology because modern epidemi epidemiology often follows many of his practices. And for Grant, many of his calculations focused on plague. And Grant explicitly held that a plague epidemic ended not when plague was gone, but when the count of plague deaths returned to the non-zero normal rate established by plague reporting in more ordinary times. So his calculations thereby demonstrated the concept of what we now know as excess deaths as a way to measure when an epidemic was ending. So what this means, of course, is that the end of an epidemic is a process and often even a long drawn out contested process. And as an example of this contestation and the complications of this process, as well as the kind of language that's used, um, I wanna briefly talk about the end of the def devastating Ebola virus epidemic in West Africa that was officially declared over in 2016. What I want to note is that in this ending in 2016, is that twice before then in 2015, Ebola was actually officially declared over by the WHO only to have further cases observed in Liberia. So in other words, in this ending, the WHO made a total of three declarations of Ebola's end stretched across 2002. 2015 and 2016, each just months after previously claiming the outbreak was over. And not surprisingly, the WHO's language shifted in each end declaration. So after the initial declaration that Liberia was, and this was the words they used, Liberia was Ebola free in May, 2015, the second declaration in September 2015, after cases had been reported, more soberly reported an end to, in their words, an end to Ebola transmission in Liberia. Ebola was then again identified two months later. And so then for its third declaration in 2016, the WHO more cautiously announced um, that the latest Ebola outbreak in Liberia was over, adding that more flare-ups are expected. So as one news source reported at this third end declaration, there were no signs of celebrations such as the Ebola-free t-shirts that people had worn after previous WHO announcements. The WHO declared the official end of West Africa's public health emergency of international concern. And of course, keeping in mind that Again, um, the Public Health Emergency of International Concern, PHEIC, is a very specific kind of declaration, right? A declaration about international concern being over, not even just the epidemic per se. So the WHO declared the official end of West Africa's PHEIC for Ebola on 29th of March, 2016. And in its declaration, it clarified that this was not the end of the disease. Instead, the WHO explained, and I put the quotation so you can see the language here, Ebola transmission in West Africa no longer constitutes an extraordinary event, that the risk of international spread is now low, and that countries currently have the capacity to respond rapidly to new virus emergencies. And of course, this very recent research um, on Ebola increasingly indicates um, Ebola will likely continue to reappear rather than being classified as a disease that can be ended or as regions that can be declared Ebola free. So given such complexities in pinpointing ends, the resumption of normal patterns of life can often be a more useful marker for the end of an epidemic than biomedical metrics. In medieval Europe, for example, 
the return of Jews and other groups that were often banished during outbreaks of disease often signaled to contemporaries as well as to us historians the end of a disease cycle. But these returns often meant the start of a process, a new process of reconciliation. So as the account of the Venetian plague uh, by physician and rabbi Abraham Catalano demonstrates, uh, he died in 1642, so really writing about the 17th century, the end of an epidemic involved intense political and social negotiations because deep divides remained in communities that had often sometimes even viciously turned on those in their midst during the plague. For others, such as in early modern Italian city-states or in 18th and 19th century empires, it was the resumption of markets and international trade that signaled the end of an epidemic. For others, the official declaration of an end could actually mean that normal practices were disrupted because they had already resumed. So for example, at the end of the Baltic plague epidemic of 1710 to 1714, the Danish king ordered that at this end point, now that it was over, all bedding and beds of those who had been sick with the plague should be burned. In response, many common people resisted. Why, they asked, should they destroy these valuable goods that they had been using for months now with no problems and still used uh, even as sickness and death rates had been falling? So their bewilderment and the resistance indicated that for them, the epidemic had already ended and normal life had long resumed. The royal decree was therefore an unreasonable and expensive intrusion. So an official declaration, whether by a king or an international body such as the WHO, is thus only one part of an ending of an epidemic and does not suffice on its own. This means that epidemics, and particularly their endings, can thus only be understood within a broader context of continuing disease. Influenza A, with its various strains that are in circulation throughout the world, is a classic example of a disease that rises to epidemic, that is problematic levels, and then returns to endemic or acceptable levels in unpredictable ways ever since it first appeared among human populations in the 1500s. So given that an epidemic is defined as an increase in incidence beyond usual rates, the end too can be clinically defined as, and this I'm quoting again from public health guide guidelines, it can be clinically defined as the reduction of disease incidence, prevalence, morbidity, or mortality to a locally acceptable level to achieve what is widely described as disease control. Yet as ambiguous terminology such as acceptable and control demonstrates, this status is necessarily achieved through a process of negotiation between different, if not competing interests. Particularly as historical examples demonstrate that an epidemic's end can be gauged by the resumption of social and economic practices as much as through biometrics. And indeed, I think this very process of an end highlights competing approaches to disease. Discussions on the ending of HIV AIDS makes this very clear, right? So in discussions on how to end HIV AIDS, we see that debates as to whether it's more effective to invest in vaccine research, in medical therapeutics, such as antiretroviral therapy, or in social and political and economic reforms, each articulate different methodological understandings of the epidemic. Such divergent approaches, of course, also reflect different global circumstances. What might be feasible in communities with sophisticated health structures cannot usually be replicated in those confronting limited and unstable medical support, if not also political fractures. So what is deemed a locally acceptable level of disease is thus necessarily a process of social and political debate as much as it is about disease itself. And so here I'm going to turn to my final and concluding point. More generally, what I'm suggesting here is that a focus on ending helps us rethink how we study epidemics and disease more generally. The end process is not simply the downward curve of an epidemic. Instead, it marks a different way of thinking about the epidemic. That is, a society's understanding of an epidemic is different at the beginning and climax of an epidemic than it is at the end of an epidemic. When communities are thrown into panic and turmoil 
by the outbreak of a new disease, when medical committees are convened and central governments spring into action, epidemics are understood in clear biological terms. Likewise, in the hunt for a carrier, the identification of a pathogen, and the investigation of its modes of transmission, these all focus on the biological nature of the disease. But at the end stages of epidemics, the disease is regarded through the filter of political, social, and economic dislocation, and dislocations that have deepened as the epidemic progressed, articulating the processes by which policy decisions are debated and implemented and the accommodations that have been made between scientific models and human behavior. So when epidemics end, emergency response teams leave and governments direct their attention to more pressing problems. Local communities revive their normal patterns of life, dealing not only with the epidemic's repercussions, but also its after effects. Thus, the epidemic can be viewed as having ended even as dislocation, cases, and fatalities persist. Now, what I'm saying here is not just a reminder that the crisis of an epidemic, the, the political, the social, and the economic crisis does not end just because disease rates slow down. Um, many scholars have noted, for example, that most pandemics have ended in different times and in different places. HIV AIDS, for example, may have ended for most in what we call the global north, but in many ways has simply moved and continues on as an epidemic for many in the global south. Um, we can also look at the second plague pandemic, which has, again, very um, uncertain start and end dates, depending on where you are. So somewhere between 1350 running to 1830, the, the second plague pandemic, it's argued, receded from Europe, while most of the world did not witness anything such as an end to plague. So as the scholar of the Ottoman Empire, Niktek Barlik points out, focusing on plague's end in Western Europe obscures the fact that plague did not disappear from the rest of the world. Indeed, what she suggests is that it's more accurate to suggest that plague simply went into abeyance in a few select countries for a short period of time because it's actually remained active within rodent populations where it remains endemic today and with scattered human cases regularly reported throughout the world. So Varlet points out that epidemiology, of course, as a discipline formed itself in the West during the same period of abeyance. So as she argues, this undue focus on plague's remission in Europe, this brief intermission of plague only in Western Europe, encouraged Western epidemiologists and thereby Western epidemiology itself to develop an optimistic belief in human ability to control, if not conquer, disease. So as a result, we may want to step back and ask, what if narratives of an epidemic's end focused not on human agency, but on the role of ecology, climate, and even chance? What if they were written from a non-European perspective, perhaps even from a non-human perspective? The narratives that might emerge from these perspectives would likely show continuous cycles of disease. We might see instead a world that has continuously lived with plague and adapting to its movements. Such a perspective would replace a linear narrative of outbreak, increase, decline, and end of epidemics. Cholera, for example, which may have ended as an epidemic disease by the close of the 19th century for many in the global north, is from the perspective of the global south, a continuing disease that's associated with wars, with political fractures, and with economic upheavals. Moreover, recent scientific research on cholera has demonstrated that it's naturally, even fundamentally, part of lake and coastal marine ecosystems. So the cholera bacteria are marine organisms with permanent niches all over the world, meaning that they are endemic. So as a result, perhaps an end can be identified from the immediate vicinity of an individual epidemic, but from a perspective that ranges globally, as well as across a longer time frame, each ending begins to blur into a multiplicity of ends, if not repeated waves. What if, as anthropologist Christos Linteris asks, each end is merely a hiatus before the return of the next wave? 
Would such a cyclical narrative be a more accurate model for the behavior of epidemics? For example, the second plague pandemic was itself composed of a number of individual epidemics and outbreaks, each with their own regional end. Only from the vantage point of the 20th century did it come to be considered as the precursor, of course, to the third plague pandemic, which itself has very debated um, beginning and end dates, again, depending on where you are, somewhere between 1850, ending somewhere around 1960. So in other words, narratives of increase and decline, outbreak and end, may not only falsely suggest humans' ability to conquer disease, they also outline a linear count of the disease itself, as identified by Rosenberg. Such narratives also isolate disease from its ecological setting. Long before COVID-19's entanglements with comorbidities, researchers have pointed out that disease fundamentally interacts with other diseases, and epidemics too are fundamentally shaped by concurrent and previous patterns of disease, along with social frameworks and practices connected to memories and to fears of disease. So as the anthropologist Wenzel Geisler and Ruth Prince observe, COVID-19 in Kenya is best described not through a linear or cyclical narrative, but as one long epidemic, arriving alongside recent and ongoing outbreaks of Ebola, cholera, HIV AIDS, tuberculosis, and cancer. So a longer time frame may provide even more insights along these lines, such as how the mapping of influenza ep epidemics across the entire 20th century reveals the interaction of their various strains instead of simply focusing on one single epidemic. But this also means that our urge to see the end stage as a time when we articulate lessons learned or for historians, what history teaches us, this urge may need to be restrained. As Robert Peckham has recently pointed out, a lessons approach to the past reinforces an idea of the past as a series of interlinked crises that offer instructive insights into cause and effect. And I think right now, for example, when we're being asked for insight in the forms of lessons learned, this can be very flattering to historians. But in the long term, providing insight into the form of what history teaches us can actually undermine historical expertise and understanding. The notion of learning lessons from epidemics, of having endings as moments where we can reflect on what has been taught fundamentally relies on an overarching framework in which epidemics appear as discrete but comparable events stretching back throughout all of time. One of the images that's been circulating a lot through COVID-19 are images, I mean, this is one of them, but there's various, uh, there's variations on these. So this one is from the website Visual Capitalist, which is this interesting visual representation, representation of history uh, really done through disease. So a kind of global history of disease through these balls, each ball representing a pandemic in the past, its size according to the numbers of death. So you can see smallpox is, here listed as orange happening in 1520 with the largest numbers of deaths um, at 56 million, only um, dwarfed by the estimate for the numbers of deaths from the Black Death. COVID-19 here is captured uh, a year ago at mid-March 2020 levels of some 300,000. Now, many historians have objected to all sorts of parts of this image, right? How it doesn't actually accurately um, represent deaths as a proportion of total global population. So it's a bit difficult to judge sizes of death, but also how it represents what are actually highly contested figures as being certain and definite figures. If we take the figure for smallpox in the Americas, the 56 million number, of course, this is actually based on a very rough guesstimate of what is called pre-contact population in all of the Americas, which is very contested, right? Depending on which scholar you ask, pre-contact population of the Americas could be 8 million or it could be over 100 million. It also, of course, depends on a blunt mortality rate um, of encounters with smallpox. I think this one is calculated on a 90% mortality rate for smallpox. Of course, we know not only that mortality 
varies widely, but we also know that many of the deaths calculated in this period were not actually due to disease, but due to overlapping military and economic activity. But my bigger complaint is actually with the overarching portrayal of this history of disease, of this global history of disease. What I think is very problematic is how this portrays empty spaces within history, these empty spaces between each pandemic, as if these are periods of history that are free from disease. But of course we know there's no periods of history in which we're free from disease. Instead, these so-called empty spaces are actually full of disease, full of what we call endemic or acceptable diseases. The diseases we know today that we live with, such as tuberculosis, heart disease, and diabetes. So we need to remember that the opposite of an epidemic is not a lack of disease, but endemic disease. Endemic disease, of course, doesn't mean disease that doesn't cause deaths or high mortality. Indeed, cumulatively, endemic disease often causes much higher rates of sickness and mortality across long periods than do epidemics. And of course, we should remember there's no particular number or threshold when endemic disease becomes an epidemic or when an epidemic recedes into endemic disease. As I've outlined, this notion of what is high or an increase necessarily relies on an underlying category of what is acceptable and normal or expected rates of disease. So focusing on endings and seeing them as a process and a process which needs to be contextualized within continuing cycles of disease helps us to step out of this framework in which the history of disease is simply an account of individual epidemics. Such a framework of history as a long chain of epidemics in which our most, most current epidemic can simply slot into at the front um, within this long line of epidemics is of course, this portrayal is very attractive. For historians, it makes us directly relevant sought after, suddenly fascinating on news shows and even in informal chit chat with our friends. More broadly, it's also attractive because it fits this current epidemic into a linear narrative in which humans have always in the end conquered each disease. Some scholars have even linked this history of epidemics to colonial and political ambitions. As the historian of South Asia, Kavita Sifarma, Sivarama Krishnan has recently argued, it has been politically convenient for experts and policymakers to construct and characterize epidemic diseases as being dramatic and episodic only so that their elimination can be claimed easily. But this framework, this linear framework is misleading, not only because it does not include the full range of disease in our historical record, but also because we are in danger of applying the lessons of the previous epidemic to the next one, of thinking that each is not only comparable, but also similar, instead of highlighting differences. Just as those facing the 1918 influenza epidemic vainly tried to apply the practices and theories from previous tuberculosis outbreaks to influenza, so it could be that our understanding of COVID-19 has been unhelpfully shaped by remaining in the framework of influenza, if not 1918 itself. So taking the so-called lessons learned from one epidemic, pointing forward into the next one and not realizing in what ways each epidemic is different. By focusing on ending, and on the process of an end, this means that we can pay attention to the full context of individual outbreaks. Epidemics in this framework are not a series of discrete and comparable events. Indeed, they do not end firmly or even definitively. Many of them never end, instead simply slipping under the radar or ending only when, as historian Dora Varga has pointed out, they become someone else's problem. Focusing on ends or even non-ends, as the case may be, also allows us to question the very category of an epidemic. As Robert Peckham reminds us, an epidemic is a monolithic category that's imposed upon the world. It is a periodization that involves exclusions, not only of people and places, but of time, of what comes before and what comes after. Focusing on ending therefore encourages us to analyze our given categories and to challenge our accepted periodization. 
After all, those who study epidemics are well aware of their complexity and their unruliness. So for example, Major Greenwood is one of the early theorists and practitioners of epidemiology. He worked on a range of diseases. He also recorded and analyzed the 1918 influenza epidemic in England. And he built on such experiences to establish both mathematical and the fieldwork premises of modern epidemiology. Um, and writing in 1935, Greenwood pointed out, epidemics behave so willfully, the population will not stay put. All kinds of disturbing and, as we think, irrelevant factors destroy the simplicity and symmetry, symmetry of the phenomenon. The same, I would suggest, can be said for their endings. By focusing on endings, when the relationship between society and disease is unruly, when the definition and category of an epidemic is debated and contested, in endings, we can start to see the categories and periodizations that we have imposed and thereby reframe and rethink our long-term approach to understanding disease. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, I would like to thank uh, Erica uh, for her very nice and uh, interesting lecture. And uh, I'm now opening the discussion. So if you have uh, any comment uh, or question, you can now uh, turn uh, your microphone and uh, video on and you can ask directly. I think, Tomáš, that there, are, there were people raising hands. So perhaps uh, you, should, you should ask people to raise hands and, and, and okay. call them individually okay uh, so if uh, anyone uh, uh, has uh, any an, any question uh, you can uh, raise uh, your hand uh, yes uh, Vojta, please oh. oh thank you very much for your lecture and of course i, I naturally i have a question about Thucydides and about a great athenian plague because well uh, if if I remember correctly, so Thucydides is a very different historian from, uh, from what we consider as a history today. We, re we, we really think very much in linear terms. And he, he, he thinks uh, uh, cyclically. And uh, he, I think at the beginning of, of his great book, he just says, okay, I am I recording these events because uh, certain patterns always repeat, and if if I look at his description of the plague, so I um, I have an impression that what he wants to uh, say is just uh, uh, that he, he wants to portray people in a very extreme situation, and that's that's his point. That's his actual lesson. So so uh, I think that it's very interesting to look at the different backgrounds of contemporary history and then of Thucydides, because yeah, it, it's, a, it's a very different kind of history. And uh, other things, which, other thing which is really in, interesting is that he uh, limits himself just to the description and he is not interested in speculations about divine origin of the disease. And he even claims that, okay, physicians would, would put forward many, many explanations and causes of this disease, but that's not, that's not so important for me. I just want to have a pure description. So, yeah. so that's, that's really, that's Susie Lees, he's a very special guy. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and, and look, I agree entirely. I think one of the things I find so interesting is that I think we, I mean, you're right. He's Thucydides, he's specific. He's making, and I think you're right, obviously there's a, 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 a moral framework and this notion of what, what do we learn, how we're using disease in some ways, right? I think he's using disease to give us some kind of broader lesson. But what's also interesting is how I think we've inherited this and kind of forgotten that context, but instead used it as our way of then repeating our, our impression of what we think an epidemic is Right. And I think it's very true when you read Thucydides and then you realize that actually now every, every history that you read of an epidemic. Um, and I noticed, I thought it was so interesting during COVID that there were these people who were 
trying to model their their records on you know Defoe's records, and Defoe himself is modeling it on someone else's. So you see this weird way in which you're simply modeling previous practices, and yet perhaps okay. not really thinking. Is this have does this have anything to do with disease, or is this actually a social commentary, or is this a moral okay. commentary? Which I think is is um, very much the point. And so I agree that there's there's an interesting point about his view of cycles, even within this linear framework, and whether we can ever detach ourselves from that framework, right? And so I would I would like us to to work at a, a new framework, not because I don't think Thucydides is wonderful. But I actually wonder if that's not the, the most useful framework for understanding an epidemic. If, if I can ever follow up for this, actually, uh, there is a very interesting description based on Thucydides in Lucretius. And uh, if you look at Lucretius' De Rerum Natura, so the whole work ends with a description of Athenian plague. And it's very interesting to compare both texts. So, uh, so actually, actually, Lucretius gives some reasons why why this plague happened. It was because of the bad air, and it was yeah. because of of some uh, atomic atomic germs coming from 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 Egypt. And yeah, yeah and once again, uh, the Thucydides is really, really special because because okay this uh, lucretius you you also have no divine intervention you also found some natural causes for this disease and you have a cyclic you have a cyclic history of time but still you do not limit yourself just to the description yeah, yeah. yeah. you want more which is yeah. which is very which is very human i would yeah. say <laughs> yeah i mean i, I would say cuz look for me the most interesting part i felt like a lot of this research has been going back to accounts that I thought I knew and looking, what, what do they say about the end? And I really mm. was, so the, the plague returns in Thucydides, but it is clear that, like you said, maybe because he's more focused on, on thinking about society, mm. but there really is not a description of the ending process. So we do not get a description of what mm. happens when we move towards the end. And I think mm. that's to me, that's that's a notable point because I think in mm. the same way that we do continue to have that absence. We're not so interested. Yeah. Um, the war returns. Um, that's the that's kind of the the, the main focus for him. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, okay, uh, Karel has got a question or a comment. Um, it was it was a great uh, great and inspiring lecture, I have to say, particularly considering what we discussed before before this uh, lecture that that historians are supposed to also somehow serve the society and and uh and this is an opportunity to do so uh i have several questions so so let me start with with this um how do you define epidemic um when uh in relation to uh to uh, non-infectious phenomena or phenomena that are culturally infectious rather than, than biologically infectious, uh, like obesity, for example, or even more interestingly, uh, something like femicide, when, uh, when uh, daughters are less cared for or killed in favor of, of boys. So how does that... Uh, is, is it still epidemic or endemic in certain parts of the world? Um, is obesity an epidemic, for example, in the United States? Great question. So um, it's interesting. Rosenberg briefly refers to, I think, car accidents or, or a few other things where he talks about this notion of epidemics and, and how obviously we usually talk about them in terms of infectious disease. And I think this is where his notion of how it's a it's an event and not a trend. And interestingly, kind of, therefore, I think it doesn't become part of the focus, but you're right that we could, I mean, there's overlaps, right? So diseases indeed that are non-infectious diseases, but still major problems. Um, I think in, in America, there's often this discussion about the opioid epidemic, and that's a major health problem. Again, how you should define it. And it strikes me that, of course, this gets to the heart 
of what people say when they say it's an epidemic. It's, it's an argument. And it's an argument saying, this is a problem. It's not normal. It shouldn't be accepted. And we need to fix it. But this is why I also think you see these campaigns for public health campaigns in which what you're first trying to do is to highlight that this indeed is a problem, right? Cardiovascular rates are a problem. Um, having the awareness of how many people die or are, in, are injured or the kind of, um, what do you say, it's the, the economic costs of whatever the problem is. So I think this is why I, I mean, it, it partly relates to how we talk um, I'm not really a, a linguistic police person, so people can use these arguments, but I think this is why we need to be aware of how each category of an epidemic is indeed an argument. But you could make the case for even for infectious diseases, right? There are infectious diseases that we don't classify necessarily as an epidemic, and there's also things which we call a kind of disordered outbreak, as we can see in history, and only 200 years later have we decided that actually this is something called an epidemic because it has some kind of coherence and some kind of periodization. So I think it, it, it can cover um, all of those cases. If, if I may, if I may uh, continue uh, or, or come up with, with a follow up, uh, you said you, you define epidemic as something that is recognized as being a problem. Uh, let me challenge you. Is it a problem necessarily? Is, um, is obesity uh, seen mm -hmm. as a problem? And who is the person who makes the decision? Yeah. Um, particularly in, in the light of, of, uh, of, of current uh, movement, which uh, we have this, this movement against body shaming, for example, which, yeah. which basically legitimizes obesity. Uh, and, and also, if I go back to my other example, the femicide, uh, I, I've got suspicion that substantial part of society that were performing these things didn't see it as a problem, but as a necessary act. And yet it has certain parameters of epidemics. It, is, it spreads, yeah. uh, it can be suppressed. Um, perhaps quote unquote cured. It's an interesting point. Partly, I think it's about medical language, right? And and our perhaps our reliance on the language of medicine to define something because that might be one of the most um, persuasive ways to say that something is a problem and as you say, a problem for whom and a problem that requires what types of solutions. So I think that's also implicit within the category. But as you say, this is a language about cure and about contagion and what exactly that means. Um, a lot of the texts that I was reading on mathematical modeling, of course, are interesting because the modeling of, of uh, infectious disease outbreaks, they um, link to the modeling of um, financial markets, right? And 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 the the point for many of these modelers is this is a this gives kind of credence to what they do because in many ways they're talking about similar phenomena and they talk about the contagion. Um, and now, of course, it's applied to social media and the notion of what makes something popular, what people do, whether you can kind of do a kind of R rate on. Um, you know, social media posts as a way to examine popularity. So I think it's interesting that the, the methodology is a similar one. The language is similar. It's true that there's a concept there about thinking, I think, at the level of population, which is similar, um, whether that means that we necessarily have to accept it. And I think, again, this is partly thinking about when we use these words, they're making certain claims and arguments about who's defining the problem and therefore also who has the kind of authority to um, intervene in these problems. And of course, I'm not trying to say that there's no such thing as disease or that there are no epidemics, you know, plague is not a problem or COVID-19 is not a problem. But I think it's quite clear that the, dis the decision-making, right, this notion, what is acceptable, what is normal, what is a problem, what is a crisis, these are discussions that require 
not just medical information, but actually some kind of agreement within a society as to what that means. And I think if there's not that agreement, then you can start to see how there's, um, therefore, this process of contestation where people are pushing back because they don't agree with the definition. Okay, yeah, thanks uh, for these uh, comments uh, and questions. And uh, I'm asking uh, if uh, anyone else uh, has uh, any other comment uh, or question. Uh, you can uh, raise your hand uh, or you can ask uh, directly. If people have examples of ends and the process of ends, I'm always basically, I feel like now I'm like a collector of um, examples because of course, one of the things um, as I was saying before with this project is it strikes me that we do want, we want to be thinking widely and thinking across disciplines. Um, and I think this is where bringing in these different examples um, is very necessary, but I think it's not, I'm not going to be able to collect them all. So I really am hoping that people can, can offer them in various ways. Okay, uh, thanks uh, well, for this suggest, interesting. Uh, uh, I, I would definitely suggest looking at, at uh, uh, vaccination, uh, smallpox mm. vaccination, as an example of beginning of the end of something, which is, which by the way, is 300 years uh, anniversary this year, uh, and uh, and that there are probably even earlier examples in Europe which ha haven't been published so far properly. So so that's that's my suggestion. That's a good one. Okay. Uh, thanks uh, for these uh, interesting points. Uh, are there any more uh, comments or questions? It seems uh, there are no more questions uh, or comments. In that case, uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, again to, to Erika for uh, accepting our uh, invitation to, to give us an uh, online lecture. Erika, thank you very much. It, it was a very nice and interesting and stimulating lecture. And I would also like to thank uh, to, to all of you for participating. And uh, I would like to wish you a, a very nice evening. Thank you very much. And thank uh, you. see you on any, any other uh, occasion. Thank you and goodbye.